Glad to see you all here, everyone, as we continue our journey through the gospel according to John. John, the beloved disciple. Always wondered, you see, the, uh, the gospels are actually written somewhat anonymously. We've added the titles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because according to church history and legend and everything else that contributes, Matthew wrote Matthew, Mark wrote Mark, Luke wrote Luke, and John wrote John, and I believe that is true, but technically, nowhere in the body of these, of these works does it say that uh, those are, in fact, the authors. John gets the closest. He refers to one of the disciples as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And yet the Apostle John is nowhere mentioned. And so we assume that he's talking about himself. Maybe that didn't sound quite so prideful back then. I don't know. Larry, was that a jab this morning at the uh, pl problem with plagiarism we've been having with famous preachers lately? I, I just wanted to emphasize the point. That <laughs> it comes from God. It comes from God. Okay, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I did not Google this sermon, although I am trying to copy from the work of the Lord and everything written down by the Apostle John. So uh, accuse me of plagiarism all day long, uh, but I did not get it word for word from uh, anywhere on the Internet. So... We come today to one of my favorite passages. In time of trouble, in time of discouragement, I am often reminded by the Lord, and it's <laughs> sometimes not very comforting, that he comes to me and he says, I'm the vine, you are the branches, abide in me, because without me you can do nothing. And then I realize, perhaps I am so discouraged, and perhaps I am, don't feel like ministry is going where it, the way it should and my family's not going the way it should and everything else is not going the way it should because I am not doing a very good job lately of being plugged into the vine, at which point I can quit blaming God and see my own fault in all of this. And so, and I say it is encouraging because uh, it's so encouraging to finally have a solution instead of just feeling hopeless and it is encouraging to remember that God has not forgotten about you. I, was, I preached through, I've, I've been here long enough, I've forgotten what I've preached through, okay? Uh, but uh, I was preaching through Exodus, and I was struck because I, 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 you gotta re, if you're going to stand up in front of everybody and talk about something, you really feel like you've got to know something about what you're talking about. So reading the book of Exodus on a level that I had never really tried before, just paying attention to every word, um, we, we get a lot of noise in Christian pop culture about how the Old Testament doesn't apply and we are New Testament Christians and stuff, but reading the story of Exodus where Moses has uh, fled the authorities in Egypt because he killed a man and wound up in the desert of Midian, Midian and meets a girl and works for her father and, and so he's herding sheep for his father-in-law, sees the burning bush and goes to investigate. And he sees a bush that is on fire but is not consumed. And the voice of the Lord speaks to him out of that bush and says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of your forefathers. And what God says there is so applicable. I have seen what my people are going through. I have heard their cry and I know what tragedies they have had to endure. Therefore, I am sending you to preach deliverance to the people of Israel. And that is exactly the same thing God says to us today. He sees the problem that you are in. We feel like no one sees. We feel like sometimes it's polite because we don't want to bother everyone else with our problems or no one is actually going to care anyway. So we do, a, we do a pretty good job of hiding what we're going through ourselves. But even if we didn't hide it, we feel like no one would care. God sees. God sees all, whether we want him to or not. But he sees what your problem is. He, he hears your cry. Someone is listening, and it's the God of the universe. And he knows what you're going through. And he has sent us to preach deliverance, just like he sent Moses to preach deliverance to Pharaoh. We're going to get delivered from you. And to the people in bondage, you're going to get delivered. So 
Uh, sometimes I'm going to talk bad about the crowd that says, oh, don't pay attention to the Old Testament because I love the Old Testament. That is so applicable to my life. God sees what I'm going through. God knows about the fight that I am in, and he has sent me to preach deliverance to the captives, and that is what we need to be about. And so when Jesus comes to me and says, I'm the vine and you are the branches, and just like when you chop a branch off of a grapevine, it ain't producing any grapes. Get your head in the game. Get plugged back into the vine. And draw that nourishment not just for yourself, but so that you can produce fruit. That is where we are going today. And it's not a... Uh, it's not a you must produce fruit, you must produce fruit. We need to produce as much fruit as possible. We need to figure out how to turn this into a fruit factory so that we can produce all the fruit that we can. We don't care if it kills the tree. Sometimes in our industrialist, commercialized, American way of thinking, we like to run ourselves ragged for a goal. And that is useful in many cases. Many times a coach or a drill sergeant, or someone will push you harder than you ever thought you could go, and you learn. You learn that you can do so much more than you ever did, but many of us are tired, worn out, we feel spent. Jesus wants us plugged into the source. We know he's a healthy vine, we can be a healthy branch, and there can be healthy fruit. And we don't have to be cut off and put into the fire because we've spent ourselves entirely, although we do talk about sacrifice at church. Number one on your sheet is more of the review because it's so important that we, as Jesus is talking at the Last Supper uh, and teaching him these last, final, great lessons before he goes to the cross, Jesus is not only speaking to his 12 disciples, he is speaking to us today. So there's a lot about church we need to be picking up in these chapters. Number one in your sheet, Jesus must wash us or cleanse us, if you like a more biblical sounding word, Jesus must wash us. He told Simon Peter, I must wash your feet. Simon Peter's like, wait a minute, you're the, man, you're the teacher, you're in charge, make one of these other guys do it. I don't think Simon Peter was volunteering to do it. He was... He was the oldest. He was the leader of the disciples. Here, here, let's get John over here to do the thing. Jesus shouldn't be washing everybody's feet. And Jesus says to Peter, if I don't wash you, you're not clean. Be washed by Jesus. That is what we implore you to do every time. We're going to talk about a lot of the things that we're doing. I feel like a lot of churches, they emphasize you just need to surrender. You just need to give up. You just need to pray the prayer. You just need to get washed. But the Bible tells us that God has a purpose for our lives and a purpose for our salvation. Be saved so that now you can live with the Spirit in your heart. So what I'm doing my absolute best, and this is hard because I, I came out of this. You just get saved, and that's all there is to it. And as far as your standing with God, that is all there is to it. God forgives. You could have never made happy, God happy on your own. But why did God save you? God wants to involve you. So I struggle to preach this because I, I come out of that just get saved and everything will be fine kind of mentality. The Lord has a purpose for us all. We're going to produce fruit and that's what we're going to talk about today. But please don't misunderstand. I'm not going to give you a list of things that you must do in order to make God happy. We made God very angry. Our sin, our selfishness, the way we have twisted his creation. We are, God can't just forget about that. But he sent Jesus to pay for it. And that is the end of your sin debt to God. The absolute end of your sin debt to God. But that is the beginning of your new life. And what comes with a life, adults, a job. Amen. All right. So, that's right. Everybody get a job. Amen. And uh, so we're going to try to preach a salvation that says, be saved, be washed, be cleansed. You cannot make God happy on your own. But then, follow God's leading into what you are being called. So, number one on your sheet, Jesus must wash us. 
A leader must first be a servant. In the outside world, outside of God's people, everybody steps on each other to climb that ladder and put themselves on a pedestal, pedestal and be more important than everyone else so that everyone can see. Not so in the church and not so in the coming kingdom of God. We must be a servant. They'll know we are his disciples if we what? If we love one another and not just a nice gooey inner feeling that makes you wonder if you're filled with nougat. Am I hungry? But I'm not. But an actual decision to treat each other like family, and that had very serious connotations back in this day and age of the Bible times. You only did business with family. Who else could you trust? And you would, you would solidify uh, that by marrying into, into each other's family so you could become uh, uh, family to each other. We could live in a different society where if you hire your relative, you're in trouble <laughs> for nepotism. And I'm not saying that one is better than the other, and I'm not saying that you need to give away your daughter to whatever business magnate you want to do business with. I'm just trying to explain this is how they did it back then, and they thought in terms of family because that's the only people you can trust. And when you come to Jesus, you get a brand new family. And we don't have to give each other a pass on all the stupid stuff that we do and the ways that we harm each other. There is justice and there is judgment from God. And if you're treating your brothers and sisters in a bad way, Dad will be after you. I don't mean me. I mean God. He might send me after you. I don't know. But uh, we are now family. And so we must love one another. We will sacrifice like Jesus does as we represent him to the world. Last Sunday, and I think the previous Sunday, Jesus was tell, still talking to Peter. Peter says, I will, you know, I won't abandon you, Jesus. Jesus tells him, there's someone here that's going to betray me, and you're all going to run off, and, 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 and I'm, going to be, I'm going somewhere you can't follow me anyways. I'm going into the next world, whatever lies beyond death. That's where he's going. And, G and Peter says, I'm coming with you. I'll go, I'll go, you know, we'll go to heaven's gate, uh, hell's gate together. We'll, we'll storm whatever. I'm, I'm with you, Jesus. And he says, before, before the rooster even crows in the morning, you're going to deny me three times. But someday, Peter, you will go where I'm going. And so we are called to a life of sacrifice. This world is not worth working towards the betterment of. Now, we are going to have a life in this world. My children are going to le live in this fallen world that I leave behind. So I definitely want to build a legacy and a heritage, and there's a lot in the Bible about that. But we must tune our priorities to be thinking about the next world. We're going to be there a whole lot longer than we are going to be here. And what riches can you take to the next world, you can take people. You can take people. If the Lord doesn't come back in the next 50 or 100 years, my great, great, great grandchildren could be in heaven with me forever. So please help me build a decent church, okay? We've got to think like this. The Lord could come tomorrow. It could be another thousand years. They thought the world was ending in the Middle Ages, too, and they had it worse than we do today, even with all the darkness in the world today. So, and like Jesus does, last blank on number one, we represent him to the world, and Jesus went on a long sermon uh, in the book of John about how the Father is in him, he is in the Father, and now I am in you, and you are in me, and whoever accepts me, Accepts the Father, whoever rejects me rejects the Father, and whoever rejects you rejects me and rejects the Father. We get to be God to the world. We get to be that Messiah to the world as Jesus is in us. I told you you had a job. This is your job, to be Jesus to the world so that they can meet Jesus. And take heart. As they reject you, don't take it personally. They are rejecting him. They are rejecting him. You be like Jesus.
Don't worry about the rest of the world. Let's read our passage. John chapter 15, starting in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. <clears throat> Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like the branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so, I have, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide, abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. <clears throat> Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Let's go to the Lord and pray. Father, we thank you for all that you've given us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your encouragement. We thank you for your love. And we thank you for the fact that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And that even if we feel abandoned in this world, we can know for a fact that we are not totally abandoned and we are never alone, knowing that you are right there with us. Help us to feel that you are in our hearts. And Lord, if anyone does not have you in their heart, I pray that they would be convicted today and that they would want to change that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Number two on your sheet. Now, the first paragraph, and let's be honest, this could be broken up into like four sermons. You might have noticed that as you were reading. I always notice those kinds of things. Uh, but number two on your sheet, the branches must be attached to the vine in order to bear fruit. No kidding. But sometimes we need the simplest things explained to us, don't we? Sometimes life has done something to us or we are, we are out there and we are, have our head down. I remember learning to walk through the woods um, as, a, as a child because, you know, better late than never. And, uh, you know, I would, I would be following my dad and tripping over everything. We don't have soil in southern Missouri or southwest Missouri. We just have rocks and we have tree roots and we have everything that you can trip over. And, uh, and so my dad said, you know, be careful, watch what you're doing, you know. And so after that, 
I walked looking at the ground so that I wouldn't trip over anything. And my dad said, do you see any deer? Because sometimes I would be with him hunting. And he, or at one time he turned around and he said, would you be able to get back to the truck by yourself? <laughs> and I said, I didn't know there would be a test. <laughs> and ever since he asked me that, I was ready to answer that question. Uh, try to pay attention. It's, it's, it's difficult. For, I don't know if it's any more difficult for me than other people, but it seems to be very difficult for me. Um, but uh, so when I'm inside a building, I get turned around and I point to somewhere for emphasis and everyone tells me I'm pointing the wrong way. Well, by golly, I don't do that in the woods. Um, and, uh, but we, we, we're like me as a small child, we don't see anything around us because we have decided to focus so much on where to put our foot next that Jesus comes and says, look up, look around. And, and we dwell in that moment of selfishness and we only see our problems and we only see that, that we've got to focus on this issue and that issue and that issue and this issue and children and jobs and income and taxes and politics and everything else, and, and, and you, i, I got to tell you, look up, man. When you're down like that, you're, you're probably not looking up to see your connection to the Father. And if you've believed in Jesus, if Jesus has changed your heart, the blood of Jesus on that cross has washed away your sins, that's a supernatural event where now you are connected to the Father. And I hope you've picked up on that over the course of like four sermons where Jesus is like, I and my Father are one, and you're in me too, and I'm in you. And that's what it means to follow Jesus. Look up to God and see the connection that you have. And don't worry. Just like Peter out on that water. This is why I've wanted to preach through John for years. All the best stuff is in John. The really good stuff's in the other ones too. But, you know, Peter starts sinking in that water after he could miraculously walk on the top of it and he shouts out, Lord, save me. And Jesus is right there. He took his eyes off of Jesus and he's watching the storm and I love it. And then we're going to get to Revelation. Whew! But <laughs> John just has a way with words. I love it. And, but the branches must be attached to the vine. And we, we fail in that area. It, it's, the, it's the easiest, most stupidest thing to try to understand and yet that's where we fail we're not attached to the vine or we're not working on our attachment to the vine in order to bear fruit not just so you can feel good and you can take your eyes off of your of your life and 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 not worry so much about all those things that are there to trip you up but so that you can do what god wants you to do in the world not just what you want to accomplish in the world not just to get the political person elected that you want to get elected. Not just to make the amount of money that you want to make. Not just to live in the home that you want to live in. Not just to build the life for your children that you want to build. But so that you can do all of those things that God wants. Bear fruit. Now what is fruit in a New Testament understanding? Well, I think there's two main categories. The number one that we love to talk about is that you tell other people about Jesus and they get saved and they can see in your life that there is something different about you. And so I believe that is fruit. And we've, we're starting to bear fruit at this church. We've got visitors coming in. We don't even know how they found us, but they come in, they're joining, they're wanting to get baptized, getting saved and everything. That's great. But in Galatians, Paul tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And I hope you can say all those. That's like basic level, like we follow Jesus now. Memorize this list, okay? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Against these things, nobody's made a law. So let's just get after. But we want to see those things in your life too. And those things are going to help you tell people about Jesus so that they will want to believe in Jesus and they will feel not just that you can talk them into it. And I think that's something that scares us so much to tell other people about Jesus. I don't know if I can talk them into this. I mean, Jesus is talking about sacrifice and he's talking about, uh, uh, you know, <coughs> he's talking about all the things that, 
that, that uh, you know, we're going to go through. He's, he's told Peter, Peter, you're going to be scared for your life and you're going to deny that you even know me. I don't think I can talk people into following this Jesus. We're not allowed to do this. We're not allowed to do that. And now your Sundays are blown. You've got to show up to church and everything else. Folks, God saving someone is a supernatural event. And though we are humans, and the Genesis tells us we are made out of the dust of the earth, God has chosen through these earthen vessels to keep something glorious inside. And so, yes, we want you to speak persuasively. The Bible talks about speaking persuasively. As Paul goes to city after city and he proclaims the gospel, he's a very educated man, very sharp, very outgoing, and he speaks well, so it's okay to speak persuasively, but there is something alive in the words of the gospel and in the words that are printed in these books. And and when you share that, Jesus says it's like a seed that will take root. And a seed is an amazing thing. You know, as the kids go out and play on a playground and in our uber safe age, one of the things that might be on the ground of that playground is the itty bitty pea gravel uh, that uh, is natural in some of the places that I grew up, but you gotta pay for it here. And uh, you know, one little piece of pea gravel versus something, there, there, there are seeds that are shaped very similar. What's the difference? There is something miraculous inside that seed because despite the fact that we did think that rocks grew where I grew up and reproduced and every time you tried to clean out an area of rocks, there would be more. Um, Despite that, it doesn't actually work that way. You can't plant pea gravel and have a quarry, you know. Uh, But you can plant that seed, and something far bigger than that seed erupts out of the ground and over time produces more of those seeds, things that are useful, things like fruit, things like things like grains, things like uh, wood to build a a house out of. It's amazing. It's an everyday miracle that we skip over and sharing the word, telling people, explaining to people what this is, how Jesus works, that you don't have to live in sin anymore, that the rest of the world is lying to you. And every generation has to wrestle with how do we share the gospel? What are people uh, what, what are people's lives like? What will they relate to? And, you know, in the 1970s, it was, a, it was a evangelism explosion. Did you know you're a sinner? Yeah, I'm, I'm not perfect. Would you like Jesus to forgive you of your sin? Sure. Oh, do we live in a different world? I think we do. I think we do. Is the answer to go out and say, here's a list of sins I've seen you up to. Did you know you're a sinner? <laughs> With some people, maybe. I've seen it work. Not often. But we need to be thinking about, okay, where does what Jesus wants touch this person's life? And what can I tell them? We can give them something. We don't think it's going to work. But we can give them that message like, the Creator calls you to be in a relationship with Him. There's so many different ways to describe the gospel. You know, the God who made you says differently about life than what you're hearing about on television and streaming and TikTok and everything else. And that's what I believe. And even if you think I'm stupid, I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to keep believing this. And maybe it'll start to worm its way into people's ears. I've heard many stories of people hearing the gospel and getting angry and shouting at the person who told them, and then eventually they get to thinking about it and comes around. It's miraculous is all I'm trying to say. So we need to be out there planting that seed. And in order to have seed to plant, we need to be attached to the vine. And what's always pointed out in this, number two in there, the branches must be attached to the vine in order to bear fruit. Otherwise, they will be thrown into the fire. Ugh. Wow, Jesus takes this bearing fruit thing really seriously. So you're going to get cut off and disregarded because you're not producing fruit. Now, this gets into lots of questions about, but I thought you said I was saved. I thought you said I didn't worry about that. Yes. And it can be a bit complicated trying to work these passages together. I don't think we're necessarily talking about hellfire here. That's the short version of the answer because you all want to eat lunch at some point. You don't want to like stay here for business meeting at 6, like 
you know, you want to like leave and come back. But not only will the fruitless branches be cut, but the fruitful branches will also be pruned. Life is hard. Life is hard and we are sinful and we are selfish and God is working on us. And I love the fact that God can take someone like me and make the man out of me that God wants me to be. But it's not always a fun process. And so give God permission to prune you. And try to aim not to be just so useless that you get cut off the vine and thrown into the fire. Number four. I'm sorry, three. Apparently I want to be out of here too. We can ask whatever we wish if His words are in us. And so we did pass a verse that talked about going to God whatever we wish, but if it's if His words are in us. And that means we are in tune with what God wants for our lives. And so you don't just go out and ask God for whatever you want. There are people who preach that on television. And you're going to get tired of me preaching against them. But I'm sorry, it's, it's the truth. You don't just ask God for whatever you want. Now dream big. Dream big. There's entire countries of people, the whole government is set up to oppose God. Maybe God will put it in your heart to go over there and do something for the kingdom there. Don't be afraid to dream big when it comes to the kingdom of God. Uh, that's why we emphasize missions here. God wants to do fantastic, large, great, big things. But it's not about making you rich. It's not about all the, the focus, of course, is on the kingdom and God, not necessarily about our own little kingdoms down here on earth. Jesus tells us we can ask whatever we wish if His words are in us. Doing this to bear fruit is what glorifies God and proves that we are His disciples. So in the last chapter, we learn that they will know we are His disciples if we love one another. And so if you ever quote that because you like the idea of love and you like the idea of coming to church and people love each other and so there's not all the problems that sometimes we find at church, I want you to make sure that you also quote this verse, which says exactly the same thing, but says you must bear fruit. They will know we are his disciples if we bear fruit. Verse 8, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Because if you're not bearing that fruit, if you don't have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and faithfulness in your life, if people can't see it, and, and if no one is looking at your life saying, I want to become a believer in Jesus too, who are you following? This is the, this is the Missouri part of the presentation. Show me the fact that you really are a follower of Jesus. Where is the fruit. Don't stay up late at night worrying about it. Jesus paid for it on the cross. Don't lose any sleep over it. But God does have a job for us. Number four. To love Jesus is to follow His commands and lay down your life. As we get into the last couple of paragraphs there in chapter 15, we see uh, and I probably am just doing it a big injustice, not taking another 45 minutes to go ahead and cover everything that Jesus talks about there. But it can be summed up. Everything I was talking about in the introduction about how the Father is in Jesus, Jesus is in the Father, they are one, and, the, and Jesus is now in us, and we are in Him, and we go out and we represent Jesus. Jesus, in verses 16 through the end of the chapter, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. There are, of course, people who are going to see Jesus in our lives, and because they work for the enemy, it is going to be offensive to them. It is going to be offensive to them. And it's so easy to say yes, like Peter. I'll do anything for Jesus. I'll even die for Jesus. It's so easy to say that, and yet, when it comes down to it, it is your own personal trial to know that you are going to be rejected and vilified for doing what God 
wants you to do. Take it from someone who's followed Jesus since he was six years old. It is so easy to just get up in front of everybody and say, I, you know, I don't care what anybody thinks. But then when it happens, man, it hurts. It hurts. And you just need to, just like the ancients, just like ancient Israel, <coughs> they would bring that prized bull to the tabernacle or to the temple. And, and a, a, a bull is worth many, many, many cows, okay? That, that bull is the secret to your herd. And yet you take it and you, and you give it to the priests and they slaughter it on that bronze altar outside. That hurts. They even have you put your hand on its head before they do the deed. And, and you, man, there's a lot of money wrapped up in this bull. I mean, maybe that's why they have you do it. I don't know. I, think, I always thought that you were just supposed to kind of, you know, my sin on this animal and this animal's going to die. But man, you got to think, man, there was some farmer going, man, there's a lot of, this is a lot of money that we're just going to burn right here in the courtyard of the, of the tabernacle. It hurts every time, and Jesus wants you to follow him. And we just got to get in our mindset, you know, Jesus, this hurts, but this is my sacrifice to you. I pray, O oh Lord. And, and sometimes I'm not sure if people are upset with me or Jesus, because it's fairly easy for people to get upset with me, too. And sometimes, and they're, sometimes they're just upset, and, and I, I don't see a way out of it. And I just say, Lord, I hope that you can take this as a sacrifice, whether I meant it to or not. And I just, I just pray, Jesus, that you would use it. I feel like I've made a mess of everything. People are mad. But Jesus, you take it and you use it, and I hope and pray that out of this suffering can come an advancement for your kingdom. And Jesus tells us that there are people who will accept. There are people who will accept as we plant that seed. Some people get mad and reject it. Some people accept it. And they are new members of the family. And we can have a family bond with them. And, and you can have church. And you can have community. And you can have all of these things. It's, and, and, and if they can be Jesus to the world, they can be Jesus to you too. And when you're needing Jesus, man, they show up in your life and they are that way to you. And you can go and be Jesus to your brothers and sisters in Christ too whenever they need a visit from Jesus. And we can have church. And that's what Jesus wants church to be like. None of this is for those very important, very high regarded 12 men alone. In fact, one of them was Judas, so that should make you feel a little bit better about yourself, right? But it is for us. Number four on your sheet, to love Jesus is to follow his commands and lay down your life. This changes us from servants to friends. Jesus said in there, no longer do I call you servants. Servants don't know what, the, what their owner is up to. They just go and follow orders. Jesus says, now I call you friends, and I let you in on the plan. And this is the plan, that we conquer the world with the gospel, and that we conquer Holden with the gospel, and that we conquer Pittsville with the gospel, we conquer Kansas City with the gospel, and that people believe in Jesus and bear fruit, and it spreads. This is the plan, and we're not servants anymore. We're not the slaves anymore who just have to follow orders and do what Jesus commands. We are a part of the family that owns the estate. And we are in on the plan. And we are expanding this estate, this kingdom, to the uttermost parts of the earth. And our work is here. And you might get called to go work way over there where no one's ever heard the gospel before. The International Mission Board tells us that as much as a billion people still live in a culture that doesn't have any gospel witness. And half the world's population lives in a culture and, and speaks a language where there is less than 2% of it taken with gospel, uh, gospel uh, witness. There are less than 2% of evangelical Christians in their culture that speak their language. And so the task is great. And we know about the darkness that threatens to envelop us all here in the United States and the things that they are teaching children and the things that 
are getting passed off as good and righteous and it makes us bristle, but we know who wins in the end. Amen? Amen? And we can go out and we don't have to fight. They may want to fight. but We don't have to fight and we can show love. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And so the willingness to lay down life for people to be able to get to know us and see that we are not out to subdue them, to beat them up for whatever thing they are involved in, that we would show them the love of Jesus and show them that, and, and it, may, it may be the long route. They may have to take a good long look at our life and say, man, they've got something I don't have, and eventually come around. I think we're going to see a lot more of that, a lot more. But we must stay faithful so that when we stand before God at the end of our lives and at the end of time, we will be able to say, look, I, I really did do everything I could. And Jesus will be like, I know, I was watching. And I, I want to be able to say that to Jesus. Now, I know I, I still fail, but uh, the call is on my life to do everything I can to beat back, to take the light, because we now have the light, and beat back the darkness. I want to call this church into the same mission. Take the light and fight the darkness wherever you can find it. Father, we thank you for all that you've given us. Oh, Lord, bless this time together. The words from your poor preacher and the way he sometimes talks in circles, I just pray, oh, Lord, that you could use it, that your call on my life would be evident in a supernatural way that people could see that there are some things that get accomplished that could never be me. It must be you, O oh Lord. And <clears throat> I pray for our church that we would be willing to lay down our lives, that we would be willing to dedicate the rest of our lives to serving you, knowing that you do want us to take care of our own affairs, but that we want to do that with your kingdom in mind. In Jesus' name, amen.